Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Holistic Human Optimization Show. I am your host, Ronnie Landis, and today we have a very, very special guest. This is a man that, at this point, really, truly needs no introduction, but over the last 10 years or so, he's really, I've really come to find that he's been, for me personally, a really good friend, a colleague, and a mentor and one of three people in my early journey that I have to attribute to giving me the catalytic spark for me to even exist the way that I do. As, as everyone knows me as Ronnie Landis, Ronnie Landis would not exist in this form and in this, this career by far without the inspiration, the early inspiration of finding this man on YouTube and then uh, going to his events, reading his books, and just really getting inspired by my own download to become an orator and to become a voice for a message. And, uh, you know, it's taken me on a 10 year journey sitting here right now on this, uh, this call with this individual. This man is David Avocado Wolf. And we have some interesting territory to cover. We did uh, two interviews before over the course of a few years, really amazing conversations. Definitely check those out. But right now, we are uh, we are going to dive deep into some interesting rabbit holes. So welcome, David. Thank you, Ronnie Landis. That was awesome. I'm in a chocolate factory right now. So I'm going to go with a full gear at the moment. But, but I may I may lighten the load. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how the ratings are. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's pretty special for me that you are, you're coming to us from the sacred chocolate, sacred chocolate, uh, you know, laboratory. I, I have my own history with that place. And, and uh, you know, Steve Adler, sacred Steve Adler, he, you know, through, through connecting with you and your work, I got introduced to him. Actually, the first event that I ever went to of yours in San Francisco, where I got to meet you, I met Steve Adler in his full-on rainbow Willy Wonka gear, and he's become a very dear, a dear friend and brother of mine as well. And uh, just on a quick note, I was talking to my friend last night about you know just longevity conferences and and uh, what that had done for me and how that activated me. And I, I remember that event, and I was kind of you know I got into raw food and I've been into it for and I got into cacao and everything and. I was into it for about six months, but I was really much on my own. I hadn't found my community in, in that event that you did in San Francisco. Some of my closest friends and allies in my life were in that room at the same time. And I remember sitting there in the front row seat with, uh, with my, my good friend, Hoy Sauce, and I was watching you doing your thing. And I had this moment where my entire, my destiny course corrected. And I had this thought, I could do that. I saw you do just, just ranting and raving as you do about everything. And I just had this thought like, okay, I, that, that's what it is. I, I could do that. I could do what he's doing. And then that started me off on this 10 year journey doing what I do. And so I have to, I have to just kind of, uh, you know, mention that because, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a really special moment for me. Right on. Thanks. That's, that was a fantastic event. And um, it's, it's always amazing to be doing these events and find out where people really are. Being out with the people is really an interesting life path. You know, because a lot of times we're in one little niche or one little job and we don't really meet the whole country, the whole world, Canada, USA, Australia, UK, you know, what's going on in South Africa. You know, it's like having that outreach to reach the world it really has a, a profound impact on you. It does, yeah. And I remember a moment where you had a bag of cacao beans and you threw it in the audience and me and Hoy's hands went up and we both grabbed it and we almost got into a little scuffle <laughs> fighting over the cacao beans. I just remember that. That was a fun time. Um, but you're, you're right. You know, these live events are so powerful because in our day and age of social media, it's so easy to get stuck behind the computer and be kind of, be kind of like an armchair scientist or an armchair nutritionist and peddle off information. But it's so different when you're actually seeing what people are going through and the type of people that show up at events and the people you meet. You really get a, a real deep empathetic connection with what people are going through. It's, it's you know, it's deep and profound and 
you know, basically our, our civilization suffering from ignorance because we don't have the experience of actually meeting the people on the street and what their real issues are. And, uh, and for that reason, we get wound up in all these ideas and fanciful concepts that have nothing to do with really reality and like, you know, healing and getting these people a, a good life and, you know, getting those parts of our civilization sorted out. We're, we're a lot of times we're, we're in mental realms that are just completely constructed. They're not actually real. Um, and so to the live event, getting back on the street, doing random things. Like last night I went to a show in, in Marin County. I never go out to shows, but I was like, I'm doing the random thing tonight just to get out with the people and in the mix of everything. It's got to be done. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you getting it done. And, and that actually starts me off in the first thing I'd like to talk to you about. Um, a great way that I want to open this conversation is my own perspective, which is, you know, since you've become insanely well known in the world through social media and accumulating over 14 million Facebook followers, I don't actually think most people really understand who you are in terms of your history and the depth of experience in the health and wellness space during the inception of the modern day raw food movement prior to the internet, your involvement in many healing centers and retreats worldwide, the over 3000 live events you've done in your career. And in all honesty, without you, we would likely not have the health food and superfood movement we have today. Yay, thanks. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's like, it's interesting because, you know, people find out about me, you know, the first time they ever heard of me was on Facebook or something. And, and just the, you know, the perspectives and both appreciation and arrogance of our civilization is really crazy. Like, you know, we didn't really know until social media came around, like, really kind of where everybody's at. But like the phenomenon of trolling, haters, that whole phenomenon is just very interesting, like what it means and what it means to our civilization. And, and basically what's happening is, is that we're realizing more and more that most people are just basically, they're in a fundamentalist belief system. So they get a certain few ideas in their head and all of a sudden it's like, that's the only way that's there. That's all the evidence. That's it. And that becomes the, the way or the religion. And one of the things that's great about traveling is that breaks that down. One of the things that's great about working in different healing centers is it breaks that down because you realize there are different modalities of healing. Certain things are right for certain people. Um, if somebody has in their mind that they absolutely have to see a doctor or they're going to die, it's probably good to get them a doctor. <clears throat> you know, the psychology of the whole thing is just amazing. So it's, you know, just interesting to me that all of this phenomenon that we now know um, through social media was unknown to us 20 years ago, completely unknown. We, we had no idea of the fundamentalism that's going on. And, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm very keenly aware of scientism, fundamentalism, and what that means and, and where, it's, where it's taking us. It's like, science can do anything. We'll destroy everything, wreck the planet, turn it into a trash heap. But it's all fine because it's science. You know, that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just outrageous. And it's coming, it's actually coming to a head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, th this is actually the perfect segue because I do have a particular context and a question that I want to get across to you that is very specific to this point. Um, you mentioned the word scientism. Obviously, scientism and science are two completely different. Um, they're two completely different terms with two completely different definitions. And I think you're going to appreciate this question. It's kind of a big question, but I, I contextualized it a little bit to lead us into uh, elaborating, elaborating basically what you're saying for everyone and translating it because this is the biggest deal of our time. Um, and so to, to kind of just ask the question, essentially, I want to dive into your feelings and perspectives on Rudolf Steiner for a moment. Um, because I, because of you almost eight years ago, I became conscious about who this man was and the immortal work he left behind in the world. And it has deeply impacted my work, as I know it has yours. And what I'd like to discuss with you is the fundamental nature of materialism and esotericism as it relates to the current state of affairs with the mechanistic medical and pharmaceutical institutions and how people at large are still left in a state of total confusion as to what makes rational sense or what is being used to essentially deceive them. Okay, uh, great question. Rudolf Steiner, our guiding light. 
Rudolf Steiner is the Aristotle of our times of the 20th century. And his literature is that hundred books that he left behind and thousands of lectures that he left behind. You know, I asked a, a guy um, in Iceland who's the, he translated all, he, he translated 28 of Rudolf Steiner's books into the Icelandic language. And, and he runs a biodynamic farm way out there. And it's like the tundra out there. I mean, it's full on. And, uh, and he, he has that biodynamic farm and its original intent, which is Rudolf Steiner had created the biodynamic farm as a location and, and home for mentally handicapped children and adults. And so that, that he takes them in onto his farm there and then helps, you know, shows them how to help the animals and, and all that stuff. I, I asked him, I said, what do you think of Rudolf Steiner now after all these years of being a biodynamic farmer and translating 28 of Rudolf Steiner's books? And he said, like every great master, every single sentence that Rudolf Steiner ever uttered changes when you change. And I, and I was like, that's it. He got it. He nailed it. Um, this, this Rudolf Steiner was like a, um, is our guiding light. I don't know how else to describe it. Like the, the perspective that he brings in saving us from materialism and, and him foreseeing what was going to happen with, with materialism, you know, or the, the aramonic deception as he, as he wrote about and discussed basically this materialistic mindset deception, materialism as a causation, like everything has to have material causation right? Which is so assumed by science and scientism today that people that can't even second guess it. Like you say, look, it's not evolution or creation. It's not either of those. They can't even comprehend that you're even saying something like that. You know, that's how deep the material causation program is into people. They can't think out of it. It's like, it's just in there in it. And he called that um, the, you know, basically the, the rational mind right? Where you, you just become so rational that you forget about the other part of reality, which is the irrational. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it gets to the point where the truth scientism and, you know, seeking out of the truth with that system that they have um, actually is deleting and, and eradicating information that doesn't fit. And that's why Charles Fort wrote his book, The Book of the Damned, about the information we damn because it doesn't fit our belief system. So we'd like to believe that our belief systems are based on facts and they are not. Our belief systems are based on almost re religious fundamentalism on all sides, including science, including religion, including everything. And um, Rudolf Steiner called that that next step for us is super sensibility, like becoming really super sensible, becoming aware of like, hey, if you go too materialistic, you'll get in trouble. If you go too... Um, anti-materialistic you go too woo woo spiritual you also get into trouble so there's a balance that he talks about the cosmic christ which is that striking that that middle path which is very interesting it references back to aristotle because aristotle was the, gave us the golden mean and you know the balance of the temperaments mm -hmm. right I, I was just watching a video on youtube from one of his uh deciphered lectures and it was the four temperaments and I found that to be really interesting just on a personal level, because sometimes um, psycho, emotionally, spiritually, we go and we're going through some crazy turbulent roller coasters right now, just in our own internal world, you know, just as a human collective and the newest spheric kind of psychic soup that we live in being these, these kind of like human avatars that are psychically affected by the psychic field, if you will. And um, you know, so that video and that concept of, Everybody has a different temperament, and if you can understand your temperament in, in relative to the different temperaments of other people, then that can be really powerful. Yes. I mean, Rudolf Steiner, his, his work, like his work on the temperaments, um, his revivification of ancient systems of earth, air, fire, and water, um, his understanding of the ether forces and the numerous different ether forces like warmth ether light ether etc is is still it, it actually that there's a revolution sitting there in technology once we become aware of that that part of rudolf steiner's teachings most people are not even aware of that or even looking for technological information in rudolf steiner's teachings mm -hmm. 
you know, one thing that just came up to my came to my mind, which is an interesting kind of connective tissue to this, is Walter Russell. Walter Russell, and um, you know, I was talking to to Michael Beckwith actually a few months ago on the show, and I brought up this fact because I know Walter Russell was a huge uh, mentor to him um, from a distance, obviously. But I was reading some of Walter Russell's books, and I really dove into it. And you know, it's really interesting for me personally. I, I don't know if it's interesting to anyone else, but I found out that Walter Russell was born on May 19th and he died on May 19th and my birthday is May 19th. I found oh, that interesting. strangely, just one of those eerie things. And I picked up that book and, and essentially what I'm getting at is that there is a phenomena that each one of us is guided by some kind of force. There is a different, there is something beyond the material veil that is almost like guiding us to our destiny if we're able to pierce through the veil. And one of the great quotes that I love from Walter Russell, which you, which you obviously love because I hear you say it all the time, which is uh, mediocrity is self-inflicted, genius is self-bestowed. Well said. The man who tapped the secrets to the yeah. universe. I have his whole, his whole book collection. It's right around here. In fact, his periodic table or periodic chart of the elements is right here in front of me, actually. I look at that every day. Um, um, Walter Russell was also very influential in his ability to master certain things for part of the day and then consistently do that. So I've taken that like with the drums. That's all that I've stayed with the drums all these years is because of Walter Russell. If I had never read his books or never heard about him, I would never have stayed with it. But staying with it as a hobby, so I give some time to it every single day, is like what Walter Russell did with his ice skating. He always gave some time to it every day and some time to his sculpting every day. And he had, I think it's five things where he spent the, you know, all his time basically on each one of those things, one after the other until he got all done each day. That's amazing. You know, that, that actually, <clears throat> that actually brings up this next thing I wanted to, I wanted to, to uh, just get your, get your perspective on, which is basically like, you know, I, I've heard you say this, so I, I just know this about you, that you have a personal mantra that basically says that I am the most comfortable ever in the most uncomfortable situations ever. And I'm curious, like, what does that mean to you? And maybe explain to me and my audience how absolutely essential it is that we develop the capacity to become comfortable with uncomfortable circumstances. Oh, wow. Good question. The um, circumstances that we find ourselves in politically and in our world today and kind of where it's all headed, it's going to get uncomfortable and it's going to get more uncomfortable. So we need to develop that as a skill of survival and thrival. We need to develop a skill that allows us to adapt to the changes that are coming because the changes that are already here are, are fantastic. I mean, now we're all ready to this. You know, we're at a, this kind of like smartphone technology you can see i even i don't even hold the phone i've got it in a holder and whatever all this incredible stuff has all happened in the last 20 years what's going to happen in the next 20 well we're going to have to hustle to stay on top of our businesses because they will completely change right now social media is a essential part of a business now right what where'd that come from out of nowhere boom out, now it's like a, you have to have a social media presence what a trip so this is all part of that getting uncomfortable because to learn new skills to adapt you've got to step into discomfort you got to step into something you don't know you've got to learn and so basically what I'm, I'm saying now to people is I'm saying you've got to become a perpetual learning superhero where you are just dedicated to learning 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 at all times and the more you learn the more for sure that you can earn which can help take some stress off. The more that you learn, the more that you have understanding, right? It's, it's like wisdom about the plight of the human race mm. and, and the human condition. And so that, that helps you to develop wisdom and sympathy from learning, from reading. Um, also inspiration. We talked just at the beginning there, you know, before we got, we started recording and, you know, about that inspiration that you're always looking for. And, I found a lot of that inspiration in books I was reading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's such a it's such a critical thing. I'm um, because we live in a world where the doom and gloom propaganda and the fear, the viral infection of fear that has infected the motherboard of humanity, as I like to think of it. Um, it's a very real thing, and there are forces that are adversarial and opposing kind of this evolutionary impulse that all of us feel on some level, but the world, the materialistic and almost atheistic, not almost, but <laughs> really the way the scientismic world that we have uh, kind of been um, kind of drop shipped into and, and influenced by, it's like that inspirational force needs to be nurtured. It needs to be cared for. It needs to be, you know, given the time to really blossom. And I want to, so this is an interesting, this is kind of going in an interesting little direction. So I wanted to bring this back to our original, our original topic of um, scientism, but just from the perspective of like, I guess what I'm wanting to do or what I'm wanting to get across to people is like, what exactly is scientism? Um, in terms of how is it different from science? Because science, because when we, because there's this, because you mentioned, like, we don't want to get too esoteric. We don't want to get too materialistic. We want to be in that, that golden meme in the middle. Um, so I'm, I'm just wanting to kind of bring it back to that because, because a lot of people might be kind of confused as to like, what does that actually mean? That the muddling of the two, science and the scientific method with scientism is deliberate. So what's going on is they're basically forcing a materialistic religion down onto us that is supposedly scientific, but in fact isn't. And that's why all the opposing information has to be eradicated. We can't have any look at that. That's what Charles Fort was on to all those years ago. Um, we have to damn that information because it violates our belief. So basically what's happened is, is that that the scientific method and science has no belief system. It, it's constantly rechecking its assumptions. It, it's evolving and changes as we change. That's what real science is. That's the scientific method. Scientism is a bunch of religious and spiritual conclusions drawn via supposed science, right? So for example, our origins, where we come from, who we are, um, how we got to the earth, all that stuff can never be known. It can mm. never be known. It can only be guessed at and theorized at. So the evolution, great. Richard Dawkins, great. Tell me it's a theory. Don't tell me it's a fact because it isn't a fact. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where the scam is happening is they're trying to push this stuff onto you like it's a fact and it is not. And, you know, I, years ago when I was living in San Diego, I used to go to the um, bookstore for creationist research. Hmm. Now, I, I had this, this um, I was talking about one of my favorite books, which is Michael Cremo's, where's that book? Right there, Forbidden Archaeology. Yes. And I was talking about that book on a guy, this guy was like arguing with me about evolution. And I was like, have you read Forbidden Archaeology by Michael Cremo? And he's like, no, that guy's a creationist. I can't read that. This is typical. This is very typical of the arrogance of scientism. Very common. Also, the, the arrogance of atheism. So what's happened is, is only certain information is allowed in. So belief systems are developed and believed to be facts. Theories are developed and believed to be facts. But when you break out of that box and you start looking at all the evidence, you, you find out what's going on. And what's going on is that that scientism is just another materialistic religion. Mm -hmm. And they're selling stuff to us like the Big Bang evolution, social Darwinism, that's not based on, it's a theory. It's not a fact. Mm -hmm. Very, very big difference there. And once you buy into it and go, oh, that's, that's real, that's a fact, then your beliefs, your emotional being becomes invested into that. And how many times have we had belief systems that we were emotionally invested in that we suddenly were thrown out the window and all of a sudden, we went, whoa, that was never even true at all. But we lived by them as if they were true for 20 years or 10 years or however long. So my assumption is at this point is that all belief systems are arbitrary. They're just, they're created. Um, you might as well create a belief system that empowers you because you're making it all up anyway. Right, right. Yeah. So this, okay. So this is exactly why I wanted to bring it back to this because ultimately what I'm wanting to what I'm wanting to help people do is not only think outside of the box, but exist with no box. And this is a different concept, right? Because it's like one thing to think 
outside of a box, but you're still thinking, you're still up here, you're still living within the constraints of whatever your particular societal indoctrination and culture and enculturation is. And that's the distinction because we're so cerebral and we create and fantasize and, and make up all this stuff and live in our head, generally speaking. But it's a different thing to exist out of the box. I, I completely agree. I mean, it's at this point, you you know, it's becoming more and more clear exactly like how you can see how people are stuck in that box of thinking and belief systems. Oftentimes at this point, those that those thoughts and belief systems actually have nothing to do with anything that's empowering that person. They actually have nothing to do with reality. Rudolf Steiner went berserk on that one. Like he basically said, he said, the problem today is that people are walking around and their minds are filled with thoughts and ideas and concepts that have nothing to do with reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really true. It's, you know, if you really think about the abstractions of our mind versus the physical world of like nature, right? We're so far in an abstraction about what even nature is because we don't even live in nature. We're living in cities most of the time. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, but you know, the blind share of humanity is in a city environment. So when you're looking at that, you're like, wow, how could, how could they really have an, a concept of nature that's other than some kind of a imagination? Right, right. And, um, you know, I just thought about the, the perpetual goose chase and rabbit hole of all these theories and fantasies and, and factual intelligence. It's like we're stuck in literalism or Lysenkoism or something like we're not actually metaphorically and mythically and archetyp archetypically literate right and this is the big this is to me on a on a <clears throat> archetypical and cosmological level like we are not just this physical material being we are so much more we're not a junk food being shoveling down whatever processed food to to satiate ourselves like we are something noble and we can ennoble ourselves by our lifestyle what we put in our mouth how we think how we live all that and the thing that I've been really looking at a lot more as I dive down, dive down the rabbit hole into concepts like the Wetico virus from Native American spirituality and all these different, all these different like Zoroastrianism has the Aramonic spell or Araman as their kind of version of what we call Satan or the dark, the dark Lord, whatever, however you want to think about that, the adversarial force that lives inside of us. But you would not be able to recognize what lives inside of you if you are hyper literate, if you're hyper linear, if you don't have a metaphorical or a Jungian type of archetypical concept, which disconnects you from nature. I think the, the video I've been trolled about more than any other has been the octave of the sun, like chocolate, serotonin, sunlight, right? They're, they're all on the same gold. They're all on that same octave. It's like a different, you know, key on the keyboard. This one's middle C. You go one octave up, you hit the C again. They're the same note, just a higher octave. That's metaphorical thinking. Just the way that I've been trolled on that, like how people don't even understand what a metaphor is, is really alarming. I mean, that's, that shows you right there the co complete collapse of our educational system in America in particular. And more, I've seen that more of the problems with, with the trolling and the fundamentalism and the radicalism generally more prevalent in America. It's interesting. It's like, you're going to find people who, you know, they bought hook, line and sinker, Richard Dawkins theory of evolution. They hot, they, they bought hook, line and sinker, the social Darwinian theories. They bought hook, line and sinker, the whole um, big bang story. I mean, it's not even questionable for them. And that's that right there is a tragedy because that's a mind that's lost, right? They can't, they can no longer weigh other evidence. So they've actually closed. Right. Right. And we can see the natural, the, the evidential byproduct, bleh, byproduct of that with our, you know, just everything, the catastrophe in our environment, the, the def the, the feminization of the masculine and the defeminization of the feminine and just how we've just taken everything that's sacred and we've just almost like bastardized it and distorted it um, in this hyper materialistic linear approach to life. Yes, very, very, very well said. And then the other side then is all of a sudden people flip out of the materialism stuff. 
all the way into the guru trip on the other side, and they'll go totally, as Rudolf Steiner would say, luciferic, where where they go into woo woo spiritual, and and you know all of a sudden the body doesn't matter, nothing, none of this matters, and you know they go all the way that way, and that's why you know it's interesting, like you know your average like aramonic stockbroker is going to die of a heart attack. Mm-hmm. But then you go to the other side, like your Indian guru is going to die of diabetes. One of them is a luciferic condition, diabetes, a disintegrative condition. And the other is an aramonic condition, a heart attack, right? Plaque formation, hardening, mm-hmm. acids, mm-hmm. buildup of acids, right? Aramonic. So that's kind of interesting. So we have to strike that even balance between those two forces in all the aspects of our, our world. Um, and that's why it's good to listen to scientific method and scientific method is very powerful, but you don't, you know, and you also listen to intuition and you also listen to instinct and you also listen to experience and you, you also listen to what's synchronistically happening at that moment, you know, and many other things that are not as quantifiable as scientific method. Mm, you know, uh, this is, this is so brilliant because I recently was having a conversation with a dear friend of mine who's really steeped in um, philosophy and quantum physics. And he was bringing up this point that once you start making a transit from the hyper materialistic cause and effect way of, uh, you know, one plus one equals two, even though it really two plus, it's really not, it's, it's Fibonacci instead of just one, two, three, four, it, it actually, it's exponentially growing. That's like a real mathematical equation. But anyways, he was talking about this fact that when you make that transition from the hyperlinear into the quantum exponential growth or exponential um, type of way of living, then faith and trust become a lot more important than metrics. I agree with that. I think that's right on target. Mm-hmm. And the reason why the harmonic brain and those harmonic aspects of our brain don't want to hear that is because it's not measurable. It's not quantifiable. It can't show up in a peer reviewed journal as easily as like, you know, these three test tubes with one CC of different salt solutions or whatever you're doing in that experiment. So this is, this is what we're, we're coming up to is we're starting to come up to the, to the real truth, which is we are a complete integrated being and scientific method is one way of knowing. It's not the only way of knowing. And it may not even be the most important way of knowing. In fact, my opinion it is not the most important way of knowing. The most important way of knowing is experience, intuition, synchronicity. Those are the most important. You follow those and, and then you, you live the life you want. Um, if you don't follow those, you're, you're going to live a life that you probably don't want. And that's what we're dealing with a lot is just the misery. That's what the trolling is. The misery of, go, of going against the grain, of having to work, 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 because evil takes a lot of work, right? Because the system we're in is evil. It's basically our harmonic. It's become totally materialistic. Um, so we have to work all the time, work all the time in order to keep the thing rolling because the evil takes a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's just incredibly interesting. I think, I think really what it comes down to is the need for certainty and uncertainty, right? Um, but we've taken the whole uncertainty out of the equation because we don't want that. We don't want to feel uncertain about who we are and how we've identified ourselves and who we believe we are in relation to other people that know us from, you know, maybe our parents that knew us from a little tiny thing all the way to now. We don't want to make the, the, the fundamental changes because then it makes us feel uncertain about the world we live in. So we, we like, we rely on certainty and anything that's going to give us certainty. So we feel certain of what we're doing on this, this uh, spinning plane or ball or whatever the heck this thing is, this, this planet spaceship as Buckminster Fuller talked about. And uh, yeah, I'd like to just kind of touch on that before we, we uh, digress this whole principle of certainty and uncertainty. It's a brilliant concept. I first heard about it from Tony Robbins and he talked about these mutually opposing needs. And this is a very Steiner like concept. And it's also Aristotelian that we can have forces. Actually what Rudolf Steiner says, there's forces underneath reality that are opposed to each other. And certain forces can dominate over other forces for periods of time and change the laws of nature. And then that other force will dominate again, change things back to some other way. 
So the laws of physics and nature that we assume are forever, we don't know if they're forever because we haven't been here forever. We don't know. We don't have any data. So the, the assumption is scientism, right? But anyway, getting back to, to that point, the, the certainty and uncertainty has to do with these fundamental aspects of life that make life great. You want to be certain most of the time. But if you're certain all the time, you become miserable. You want to be uncertain some of the time because if you're too certain, you're miserable. If you're too uncertain, you're miserable, right? So you got to find that happy medium. And generally, when people are too uncertain, there's too much chaos and too much random stuff happening, they want to nest and sort things out from a, a point of power like a home or a location where they can camp out for three months or a year or whatever. When things are too certain, people are like, I've got to get on vacation. I've got to go somewhere else. I've got to get out of this. And those are opposite needs, but they are both needs of the human being. Yeah, beautifully, beautifully explained. Um, I, I feel the need, before we dive into your book, I feel the need to also bring up the conversation about the pharmaceutical industry, because I, I kind of hinted at that in relation to this, this harmonic, deceptive, materialistic, atheistic model, because as you and I and many of our contemporaries know, who study Chinese medicine and Taoism and Ayurveda and shamanism and who have done many medicine ceremonies and gone down deep down the rabbit hole of our own, our own soul, essentially, we know a little bit different than the, the basically the bad herbalism of the medical system, which is basically like inferior herbalism gone wrong, where it's all just like, medicinal herbs but oh wait a minute there's no actual herbs it's just chemicals but they kind of using an inferior herbal system to basically describe or to ascribe uh, uh you know chemicals essentially so i kind of want to just i just want to bring that up as it relates to this topic around vaccines and and pharmaceuticals etc cetera, etc cetera, and how that relates to everything that we've already discussed well, any like one size fits all can never work for the human race. Rudolf Steiner said that there are as many humans as there are diets and there are as many diets as there are human beings. Um, that the one size fits all vaccine, the one size fits all pill, the one size fits all surgery, whatever, is not natural, unfortunately. And statistically, you're going to have people that fall out the sides. And this, this, lie that we've been told that no these things are safe and effective for everybody is not true and then then the attempt to cover it up after it's been proven to not be true and the and the whitewashing and the changing of science and the disturbance of the peer-reviewed science in order to have corrupt science dominate it's going to all eventually bring the whole house of cards down it's going it's inevitable and it's basically has to come down anyway because big pharmaceutical companies giant medicine, the big hospital chains, they are unfortunately totally bought into the materialistic agenda, the materialistic explanation of everything, and materialistic causation. So meaning that there can't be spiritual causes of illness, there cannot be emotional causes of illness, because that's not material, so we can't even look at that, right? And this is going on, it's rampant. Um, I was just listening to a doctor last night, Dr. Cowan, and he was uh, discussing Rudolf Steiner's position on the heart not being a pump. And this, this is a guy who had worked with cardiologists, done heart surgeries, done emergency room surgeries, everything for years. And he's like, he's like it is known for people who open up people's hearts, you know, during a heart attack or, you know, heart bypass or whatever, that over 80% of the hearts of people, when they open them up, that are supposedly occluded with plaque are not. They're not occluded with plaque. Um, the heart malfunction had a heart attack because of electrolyte imbalance because the heart lost electrical charge through it. So it built up lactic acid and couldn't discharge lactic acid like your legs do. You know, after a while you can get the lactic acid out. It's one of the main reasons why we need electrolytes, especially magnesium and potassium for the heart, because that will cause a heart attack. If you lose those electrolytes, that can cause a heart attack. And, and he was just talking about how you know, because the interviewer is like, well, why don't you tell people about this? And he's like, you can't tell people about this because you'll be isolated in medicine. Then they'll come after you and they'll take your way your license and the whole cascade of, of problems begins. So when people say like, well, if it would have been this way, we would have heard about it. 
you, you would have heard about it if you look, but you, it's, you're not going to hear about it on the nightly news or, you know, you're not going to hear about it in some cursory, you know, post on the internet because you have to dig deeper. And that's what reading and learning is about. It's about digging deeper and investigating more. So we're not just buying into the surface stuff. Mm. That's where all innovation occurs. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought it back to that because, you know, a lot of times people are so busy and they're like, oh, I don't have time to read a book or something. But if you have a why for why you're doing what you do, you may actually change your behavior. And what you just brought up is, is like a context for why you might want to actually open up that book and get past the first chapter. Why you might want to study philosophy especially now where it's more needed than ever, why you might want to meditate for 15, 15 minutes a day and, and get out of the obligatory kind of mode of living your life and actually make some time for yourself and be self-reflective. Well said. Well said. <clears throat> more and more people are turning to the self-reflective life. More and more people are turning to a yogic style life's lives. It's, it's something that's happening, I think, because – People are realizing in the money game, you know, you can, you can play in that game to some level, but most people just don't have the fortitude to battle through it to create the you know, vast levels of abundance that's possible for us because the system's rigged against us, right? And so, you know, people are looking for others. So in the old days, it was like, okay, a money, get a house, you know, dog in the backyard, nice picket fence, whatever. That was like the vision of like, you know, where we were going in the future. Now it's an inward calm. Now it's a meditative place. Now it's searching for the answers inside. So that's a really, you know, that's like one of those examples where like the tightening of the economy and the fiat currencies actually opens up the human being actually in a, in a very important way. That's a really important point. It's like all the pressure that's, that's surmounting. It's actually an evolutionary activation point, right? Cause it's like, it breaks who we used to be or who we believe we are. It breaks the walls and that can be a, that can be traumatizing. That can be depending on how strong your, your egoic hold and attachment is to who you were or relationships or, or whatever the, the attachment is the stronger we hold on to that, the more painful it is. But there is this, I've, I've noticed it in my life, Avo, and it's, it's not the easiest thing for me, but I'm getting a grasp and a context for what it is. It's like when I, I release my hold and my control on reality or how I'm making it up or whatever, there's this moment of grace. There's this, this like, and maybe it's only for a moment, but that moment is, is a, it's a moment. And I think we're having a collective series of moments that's really a synchronistic phenomenon. And what it, what it really tells me is that, you know, it, it, Deepak Chopra said something in an interview many years ago. He said that, you know, I used to be very fatalistic. I used to be, I used to think there was no hope, but then I just, I just sat and meditated and I realized, well, I might as well do something. I might as well try to help. And it's like the, it's like, I think we've talked about this before, but it's like when everything seems like it's doom and gloom and it's all breaking down, a rose or a flower can still grow out of the concrete. And that sign of hope, despite everything else, if there is hope, then, you know, that, that can be somebody's saving grace, let alone an indication that there is a process beyond our own linear intelligence that's guiding the human evolution um, towards its ultimate destiny. Yeah, I, I really love that aspect of Rudolf Steiner because it mirrors a lot of what it comes out of Hawaiian tradition, like the Amakua, the higher self, you know, your, your guiding light, your guiding spirit. It's, it's, Rudolf Steiner talks about that, you know, your guardian angels, um, your guides, you know, the hierarchy of the angelic beings, essentially. And, you know, they're surrounding us at all times and they always have. And some of them are like assigned to you and they're unseen, um, but they do precipitate circumstance mm -hmm. when they can. Mm -hmm. And you got to follow that, you know, and, th and that's, that's like another worldview that we're looking at there. And the reason why I ended up back at the mythological worldview, which is more of that, that what I'm describing, which is kind of the Rudolf Steiner cosmology and more of how ancient peoples lived back in ancient Greek times, Persian times, Chinese times, whatever is more of a mythological worldview. The reason why I went back to that is because everything is all made up anyway. So you might as well go with what 
flips your juice on and gets you rolling and gets you happy and gets you excited and gets you um, interested in what you're learning about. You know, that's, that's why the mythological worldview for me is really important. Mm, yeah as, as it is for me it's it's such a it's such a brilliant perspective it's so essential for sanity because you know we're swimming in a soup of insanity and if you can if you become complacent it's like the slave becomes complacent to slavery i have dug in so i've dug so deep into michael tessarian's the catacombs of his work and really gotten a grasp of like okay we are swimming in a soup of human neurosis and psychosis and insanity and the slave becomes complacent to the slave master or the slavery um, to the degree that they don't recognize that they actually are surrounded by insanity because they think it's normal. So the normality of abnormality society, um, once somebody actually starts to extricate themselves from that, and they can feel like they're going a little insane. What I would say to people is if you feel like you're going a little insane, that might be a good sign that you're actually regaining your sanity. Well said, I agree. It, 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 we live in an insane world. I mean, we've polluted everything, dumped in my book, Beauty Diet, boom, finally got it out. 77,000 chemicals we've dumped into the environment since 1944. Just think about that. That's insanity. That's totally, totally out of control. And is it, is it going to help us to dump more chemicals into the environment? Is that because that's what scientism is going to give us. They're going to be like, oh, more pills, more ills. Let's, let's develop more materialistic solutions. Mm. And it will get, and that problem will cascade into something much more intense. Mm. Um, so it's all going to come to a head at some point. I think we've got a few, I think we've got a couple hundred years personally, but you know, other people argue with me when, when civilization itself, is so parasitized by it, irrational, irrational um, subject matter being sold as rational, right? Right. That's like the Big Bang. <laughs> just give us one miracle that things just popped in from nowhere, and then we can figure it out from there. That's yeah, kind of yeah. The Big Bang idea. It's like, yeah, we, we, we revel in the miracle of a baby, but once the baby's born, it's like, okay, thanks, God. I'll take it from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah, interesting times that we're in. Um, still lots of, lots of possibilities, lots of hope, lots of great things that are, you know, still yet to be done on this earth. Incredible breakthroughs, incredible heroes yet to be born. That's kind of what I'm seeing. I, I can see like an age of heroes coming. They're going to, they're going to drag humanity out of this mess and, and they're going to drag humanity out of this mess, understanding what's causing the mess which is the materialism and the materialist, the materialistic causation theories and all of that stuff. And then also the Luciferianism, which is the, you know, the, the everything's like renunciate everything, nothing matters, escape with heroin and drugs. You know, that's another piece of it. The escapism that's on the other side. And those two, you know, they're, they're going a million miles an hour that way. And we got to stay right in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely beautifully said and i i want to um i want to uh take this because you brought it up the beauty diet and this is something this is actually this is something that's really near and dear to my heart and i'll explain why in my question I, you know i have to but i have to ask the starting question about this book like what exactly sets this book apart from your classic book eating for diet because that book still to this day for me is one of my absolute favorite books on nutrition and developing a beautification of our consciousness, our way of life, our thinking, our emotional temperance, and just how we're going about our own existence. Um, and you know, that, that, so I'm curious, like how is, how is this book evolved over the last 20 years? Like, is it, how is it different or is it just like a, a complete evolution over the last 20 years when you put out eating for beauty? It's it, eating, eating for beauty came out 20 years ago. And so this is a completely updated version of where I am with that subject matter today, which is a lot changes in 20 years, as you can imagine. So for example, in this book is the whole breakdown of like food, the whole story of food where to get your food what kind of food do we want you know all that stuff is like summarized right in the beginning the whole thing is superfoods what's a superfood how do we fit that in you know what what's the reason for a superfood boom all that's in there and all the superfoods themselves in there then the super herbs that's all in there so basically this book the beauty diet 
is the first time where I've actually kind of comprehensively put together like a whole lifestyle. It's really the whole lifestyle. It's kind of like a little bit of amazing grace. It's a little bit of eating for beauty. It's a little bit of superfood. It's a little bit of longevity now. It's a little bit of, of the sun food diet. It's a little bit of all those things in there, but it's more like this. It's interesting. You know, in the old days, you'd have a book out there and then that would attract people to your retreats or events, or they want to get more information today. The book is like the repository of information. It's like, we know it's going to be stored in here because who reads books anymore? Right? So it's, there it is. And so this is designed by the way, of course, as I think, you know, Ronnie, you probably do this as well. Any page you open to, there's something there. So you can flip it open like a magic book and go, oh, boom, there's pregnenolone. Bam, let me read that. Let me flip it over. Boom, your sex hormones. What does that mean? So it has like these little bite-sized pieces in here so that the book is approachable that way, which is one of the great ways I like to read books. Mm -hmm. Open up to random pages and just start digging in. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, nothing's worse than picking up a big book. Like just, this isn't a plug, but it's right on my desk and you brought it up like this book right here. Like this book has gone through seven different iterations. I think you remember it used to be this big live it lifestyle book, Dropping Diets Forever. And it, this actually was 700 pages at one point when you first put your put your stamp of approval on it. And then I I, over here. You do? There it is. Yeah, I can see oh, it that's right here. Amazing. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, then I decided like, I need to chunk this thing down and dropped it 200 pages. But one of the things that I got from something you had mentioned about Mike Tyson, when you're talking about writing books is that Mike Tyson, every single punch, he pun he packs all his power, he gives it full intent. And so you were talking about every time I write a sentence, it's got to be intentional. It's got to pack a punch it, no fluff. No. And that's the worst thing. When you pick up a book, it's like, and you really want to get something out of it, but maybe you're not going to go through the whole thing. You want to, like, I always want to get something out of it, no matter what page I skim to. And that's definitely, that influenced me and in how I write books. And, uh, and obviously every time I read one of your, the thing I love about your books is I can pick up any book, whether it's Shug, it's Amazing Grace, it's Sun Food Diet. It's, uh, it's, I'm sure this book too. And I pick it up next week at the longevity conference. I, I, you know, I can just open it right up and immediately. It's like, Oh, the inverse paranoid. And my, literally my consciousness for that entire day is shifted just from opening up the page. I, I love that about books. Just flip open to a page, get the, get the one page download, the two paragraph download really recommend that. I learned that way back in the early days from studying success technology and, um, one of the speakers, I think it was Mark Victor Hansen, he said, you need to read every chance you can. You're in an elevator, pull the book out, read two sentences, get out of the elevator, go, to, go on to your next thing. And I really took that to heart. And so that's one of the things that I like to put into my books is that thinking of like, hey, someone's just going to open this book up, read two sentences, and then put it back on the shelf or read two sentences, put it back in their bag. So, so it has that punch for that reason. But also this idea of just becoming a reader it's, it's becoming more and more powerful because less and less people are reading and more and more powerful books are being written. Mm. That's that thing about the repository of knowledge, right? The repository of information. So this is now a repository of my whole career. This is everything I've learned in nutrition right here. It's all, you know, chunked down into one book. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's an incredible perspective. And that's hard for me to believe just from the, just because I'm, I'm probably one of the biggest consummate students of your work over the last 10 years, probably in the world, I would imagine, because I, I created a career out of all this, you know, I devoted my entire life to this. And so for me, it's like, I'm just excited to pick up the book. And obviously I want everyone listening to this, watching this live to do the same pretty much like right now. Um, because what that says to me is that you've over all this time, you've must have reached a level of refinement of perspective and, and figured out how to dial it into the, the, the essentials that are going to be essential for everyone that's going to, that's going to take on this knowledge. Basically. Yeah. As you, as you work on whatever it is, you know, your career, your information, your book, your whatever, as you keep working on it day after day, month after month, year after year, you become better at it. You become better. And so after 25 years of, of being on the road and working in all those interesting clinics like Tijuana cancer clinics and 
you know, and Wigmore centers and, you know, all the great places, you start to develop like a little bit of a, of a knowledge, you know, like a real, like you really get it, you know, because that's your, that's your path. It's your career. So I, I keep that always in mind that like, yeah, I want to get as much in there as possible, but it's never, this is not like a closed off thing. Like mm-hmm. this is the only truth. There isn't any other truth that none of that business is going on. It's like a, a, the frameworks, the stuff that's everlasting, you know, that's a very important aspect of nutrition. What is it that doesn't change? One of the things that doesn't change is a human being needs water. You know what I mean? It doesn't change that much. It doesn't matter where that human being is. There's another one that, that is pretty universal to a human being. Human beings are going to create fire. So that brings the charcoal in. Mm-hmm. And so I do get into the charcoal in this book about, you know, it, for something to be universally powerful, like extend lifespan significantly, it must be universally available. And charcoal is one of those things. It's universally available. Mm-hmm. And so therefore it has, it has this magical property detoxification property um, that's available to everyone. So that's in alignment with truth mm-hmm. because it's not just, just available to certain people living somewhere. You know what I mean? Everybody, everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want to, I want to um, ask you about that with the time we have. I'm, I'm just curious and mostly for the audience benefit like what after all this time would you say are like if there's like a basic foundational list of essentials like what nowadays because there's so many diet fads there's there's so many different iterations and ideologies and 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 i see people literally getting swung on the bandwagon it used to be raw vegan and then it was all the different subdivisions of raw vegan and all the the religiosity that that unfortunately got got into that and then then it's 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 this thing and this thing it's like it's it's an endless array of options on the menu board of the universe but to help simplify and decipher all that confusing rhetoric for people that just want to be healthy they want to be their best and they want to get connected to the natural intelligence of nature what are the basic essentials that every single person um can implement into their life that will drive beneficial res- uh, results. One of the one of the big ones, and obviously made a huge impact on this book. It's all the way through this book is grounding and earthing, and being connected to earth, being connected to the living waters of the earth, the ocean, swimming in lakes, right? Getting cold. That's a big part of this book. Um, there's a there's a, a lot in here on different like diet strategies, like you know, you basically need carbohydrates, protein, and fat. You know, when it's all said and done, one will get demonized for five years, then it switches to the next one, then that gets demonized for another five years and it switches to the next one. Ultimately, you need them all. And so the ketogenic diet, I like that because, you know, it's, it's going back to more original diet. It has that concept built into it. And I'm getting a lot of people asking me, how do I do vegan keto? A lot of people ask me that question. It's one of the hottest trending things in our field, actually. And what's interesting is, you know, we're now finding out that like, oh, wait, if you eat like fat and nothing else, like avocados, for example, and nothing else, you have a lot of energy and power for most people, not everybody because the bell curve, um, but you have a lot of energy, power, strength, stamina, and concentration for hours. And then if you put any sugar in there, though, with the fat, right, and then spike it up and down or just eat the sugar, like, I don't know, drink kombucha in the morning or something you know you get that blood sugar spike and then crash down you know we're starting to learn like those pieces of the puzzle like you don't want to spike your blood sugar in the morning you want something that's going to keep you long term with even energy throughout the day when you're fasting if you take a lot of herbs that helps a lot um so this thing of like intermittent fasting is in here and and this the whole idea of of the herbs the super herbs to keep you from being hungry I mean, I can't even tell you how that's changed my whole life. I did a 40 day um, cleanse, mostly, you know, mostly liquids and and got finally down to water fast um, from Thanksgiving to just past New Year's, you know, 2017. And what was interesting is that the herbs, if I, if I was really, really hungry and I was really, really needing to distract myself with some kind of food or something, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to the herbal teas, the complex herbal teas with the medicinal mushrooms, the whole shoe woo in there, the, um, Codenopsis root, the you know rhodiola, whatever was in there, 
and you drink those really rich teas with those herbs in there, you're good. You don't, you, I, I would just forget about it. I would all of a sudden forget about food, forget about everything. So that, that's a big discovery and an important piece to this that I got in here. Mm. I, I, I love that because it's just getting back to what's simple, what's authentic and what makes sense. And that could obviously be a longer conversation. I don't know if you know this about me. I don't know if I told you at any point, but the way that I got into all this is I had a major healing experience from my athletic career in martial arts and basketball. And I had two knee surgeries and I went through a long stream of physiotherapy. I worked with a lot of uh, high level um, rehabilitation corrective specialists. And I got about 80% after all the years of just pouring my heart and soul into rehab I was about 80% in the healing, but I had this feeling like, man, I'm just never going to get over this hump. My career is over, all this, all this stuff. And then I got exposed to raw food, and I had this idea, what would happen if I just did raw vegan for 30 days? And just because of the idea, I wasn't trying to be in, in an idea. I just had an idea. Like, what would happen if I just did this? So I did it. And what naturally happened in getting into your work, this is when you started getting really into grounding, I naturally had a proclivity to start getting into nature. I got out of the rubber sole cast, which was my, my training shoes. And I said, forget that. I'm going to get barefoot and I'm going to get my anatomical alignment back in check. I'm going to get my mobility of my feet because my feet, even though I was an elite athlete, my feet were not actually fully mobile. And I didn't realize that until I got out of the shoes and I started going up incline hills barefoot and I was, and I was sore. I was like, whoa, what the heck is this? But what interestingly happened within 30 days of just doing like juices, fruits, vegetables, too much fruit at the time, but it, but it worked for what it needed to, um, nuts and seeds and all that great stuff and getting barefoot and getting physically into nature I'd be reading Spiritual Nutrition by Gabriel Cousins, trying to even understand what the heck he was talking about. And, and, but in nature, in the park, and within 30 days, I had a revelation where I actually forgot that I was ever in pain because I ran a five-mile hike. And I had been scared to run for five miles um, because I used to do that all the time. But because of my injury, I had this thing in my mind was like, ooh, okay, don't, don't do that. And I literally one day around 30 30 days into this, I, I just something like kind of possessed me and I found myself driving to this to this park. And I just ran the thing and I came back and after all the endorphins wore off, I had a realization I was like, Whoa, wait a minute, what just happened? I started bouncing around checking my knees like, Oh, what's going on. And I realized a fundamental principle about healing is that not only did I heal myself, but I forgot that I was ever in pain to begin with. And that was the moment I was healed was when I recognized that and, and getting barefoot, getting into nature, that that was the moment my life changed. That was the moment I, I actually diverted from being an athlete as a career. And I said, wow, this is something is something real is here. And, uh, you know, and, and I had my own healing experience. So like grounding and getting barefoot and getting into nature, obviously, the raw foods was critical for that. But it was the access point to connect with nature and now my connection to nature you know as you know we were talking I'm, I'm back here in Kauai it keeps calling me back it's a spiritual thing like it's given me spiritual fortitude it's given me a connection to to God you know and the God within me it's something that um is just I, I just get goosebumps even thinking about it because it literally gave me my soul back if that makes sense makes sense to me um bring your your soul fully alive into your body because your body becomes alive and well and at the deepest level res it starts resonating and humming like it should so yeah i could see that that your soul comes completely alive in your body as a result of your physical body being a, a healthier vehicle or the healthiest vehicle it can be um but what you're what you're digging into is this this really amazing discovery which is it, when i get into the minds of like a richard dawkins or you know the science scientism people they look at nature as an enemy to be conquered and we look at nature as a pathway to healing. Right. right. And, and those are some fundamentally different viewpoints, I got to tell you. So I turned over to anyone else's investigation. You don't need to actually come up with an answer. Just investigate and see, see for yourself what nature can do for you. Yeah, the, the only way that you could competently 
think that 99% of your, your genome and DNA is all is non pro whatever the, the story is non protein coding DNA. It's inactive. It's, 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 we're a mistake. That's the whole theory. That's the whole thing. I don't want to take too much time, but that is the whole baseline crux of the matter is that we are a mistake. The creator, but the creator is just a mathematical algorithm anyways, made a mistake with us. Therefore we're flawed. We're broken. And that's the program, isn't it? That's the program ultimately is to get our, the, noble, the noble being, the human being, to con convince that it is a mistake. Therefore, it'll be compliant to any, any cockamamie solution that you present to it to, to give it some sense, of, uh, some sense of certainty. Yeah, or meaning. meaning. I mean, this, this mistake story that we're being told, which again is a story, it's entirely made up, it's not based on any, any facts. This, this is, it's, fomenting a crisis of meaning man this, search for meaning this is this is one of the reasons why we have such a crisis concerning meaning meaning of our lives meaning of our of our day the meaning of our tasks the meaning of our work you know we are in a crisis of meaning mm -hmm. and when you get connected with nature you start to connect back to reality and that helps you to understand the intrinsic meaning of things. For example, like a rainbow, its intrinsic meaning is everlasting hope. It, it, it's intrinsic, right? The, the morning sun is the, you know, the hope of the day. The setting sun, that, that final sun gaze, is saying all your prayers and everything, bringing the day to a close, and you know, casting the, the, the lots for, for night. You know, what's going to happen that night? And so that's you know, these connections to nature cycles of the sun cycles of the moon being barefoot on the earth planting trees growing your own food walking in forests walking on sand swimming the ocean they're they're very important because they are actually real experiences with real forces that are not artificial touched by human hands they're the, they're the original deal and there's something to be said for the original intent very difficult to improve on the original intent if you know that's something to meditate on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever read uh, Viktor um, Frankl's book, The Man's Search for Meaning? Of course. I read it twice, mm -hmm. uh, maybe three times. Mm -hmm. um, Man's Search for Meaning, it comes up again and again. That little book, 60 pages or whatever it is, what a powerful read. What a powerful read, a book that can change your life. And books do change lives, and books change the direction of your soul. They can change your evolution mm -hmm. of your soul. So that's one of the reasons why I feel like I need to take in as much information as possible because you never know certain bit of information, certain way that it's said, all of a sudden it pops. It has, it has meaning. And I try to keep track of those. I, I got one the other day. Let me see if I can find it here. There's a, something was said in a different way, something commonly heard, but was said differently. Pretty sure I wrote it down. Let's see. This is it. Remember garbage in, garbage out? Somebody said gold in, gold out. Mm, ah. That was good. Mm -hmm. So I took that one, wrote that down. All, all kinds of funny stuff. Let's see what else I pick up on recently. Um, ooh, prevaricator. I need to write that down. There was a gal last night, and she took me aside, and she's like, do you know what prevaricator means? I was like, no. And she's like, it's a liar. And I was like, okay, cool. Let me, let, me, let me look up that word. So I looked it up on my phone right there. And sure enough, she was right. Prevaricator. Let's get that down. It's, a, it's kind of a fancier way of saying a liar. But that was, you know, randomly out on the street. Gal was like, prevaricator. And now that's going to fit its way into some kind of lecture, some kind of some kind of thing. Yeah, because I, I wrote it down, and this will feed back later. Got to keep a journal. You know, I learned this from um, Jim Rohn. Actually, Jim Rohn was the guy who inspired me to keep a journal. Jim Rohn and Tony Robbins, really. And um, it, it's it's powerful to get these little phrases, little things like, you know, the sheeple. Here's another one: the sleeple. Mm hmm. Stuff like that. This one, this one's just new. Um, 
good one this year, by the way, an excellent one and something that's connected back to reality is the Equilux, oh, right? Okay. So the Equinox has become actually insignificant. It doesn't actually mean anything. It's just they're quartering the years off. So they're like, okay, on these two quarters, it's the solstice. These two quarters, it's the Equinox. The actual day that's important is the Equilux, which is equal day and night. Mm. And so we passed through that in the supposed Northern Hemisphere. We passed through it like in, in Lahui. It was passed through on Mar March 15th. March 15th was equal day and night. Um, Big Island, South, South Point was March 14th, equal day and night. Because it's further south. And then Central, like C Central Texas, for example, Austin. I was there during the Equilux, March 16th. And then March 17th, 18th, you know, as you go into further north, you're – Anchorage, Alaska, it's like March 19th, 20th is equal day and night. That's when it flips over and you start getting more day. Yeah, and you're kind of getting out of the Gregorian calendar, which is totally arbitrary and made up. And then you're getting into the natural cyclical calendar that you're actually intrinsically and biologically connected to, which, uh, which the implications are obvious. Yeah, like an ant. Okay, so, you know, at my house in Canada – it's, it's, you know, it was a rough winter. It's like minus 33 for a month, you know, longer, six weeks of minus 30 something. And um, sure enough, after the Equilux, a couple of days after, three days after, boom, ants. They know, they know when the light changes. They've, they're tr tracking it intrinsically It's part of their being. We are too. We're just not aware of it. But there's something about our bodies that's telling us like, hey, now's the time to cleanse, which it is right now, the time to cleanse. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you've got to listen to that spring cleaning timing, which is a natural rhythm. And it's the day, the first day of spring in reality is the day of equal day and night. And then it starts having more day in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. And um, that's what leads us to, you know, the, the real introduction of spring. Mm -hmm. we, we basically just have to rehaul or you haul out all the old programs and all the gold conditioning and basically just as a concluding point to this, this whole, this whole, everything that we've been riffing and raffing on, it sounds like to me, and I know this is true from my own experience, but it, it really appears to me that the game, the virtual reality holographic simulation that we are potentially in, um, <laughs> uh, it, the game is about unlearning and unconditioning and uncoaching every single element, every iota that has been imposed or influenced upon us and recoding and remembering and re-entraining ourselves with the meaning and the information and the belief systems that we want to believe in and we want to be operating this operating system and it's like a fun, it's like a choose your own adventure story, right? Like Bruce Lee, you know, who was my, probably my greatest um, superhero archetype icon of my life. He had one of a great co quotes, which was life has no inherent meaning other than the meaning that you give to it. And that's kind of what you had brought up as well. Yeah. It's, it, everything's made up. And so you might as well make up belief systems that empower you rather than disempower you because you're making it up anyway is kind of the concept. That's what I got from all those years of studying personal development technology. Anybody can just deduce this immediately right now. They can realize that you have belief systems that you once thought were real. You were absolutely attached to them. Next thing you know, they got flipped over, upturned. They're no longer your belief systems. So therefore, it's likely, if you look at your history of belief systems in your life, that all belief systems are suspect. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's not like what you believe, it's what beliefs are empowering you, and let's foster those. Right. That kind of idea. Right. Yeah, brilliant. So um, the last thing I, wanna, I want to ask you before we, uh, we conclude is you know just for me personally probably it's gonna be helpful for everyone else that's on a mission you know i'm 32 years old i think i got started with my particular nutrition journey similar to to you around 22 23 ish when i got activated and you know i've been in this point in my life where i've gone through a lot of uh, a lot of tribulations a lot of trials a lot of heartbreak a lot of broken broken down belief systems and identities and um you know i i 
my inspiration again, that's the North Star. That's what I'm, I, that's my fuel. That's what gets me through the dark nights or months or years of the soul, as it seems to be sometimes. Um, so I'm curious for you, you know, what, what drives you? Like what continues to drive you now and what inspires you to stay fully committed to your mission, unwavering, no matter the trolls and the, the whatever business stuff and whatever the challenges are in, in, in your life and in the world, what is it that drives you and motivates you to stay focused, stay positive and stay on your mission? Great question. I, there, there's two parts, two answers to that question. One of them is, is that I'm motivated by helping other people. And that, that is actually a big part of my motivation. That's what gets me up and moving and contributing actually is a big part of motivation for me. The other part of motivation is, is something that is unseen, which is you have to have a fire in the belly. You have to have a drive inside you that drives you beyond any ability to stop you, break you down, get rid of you, whatever. You're going to drive right past it. Um, that's something that you're born with. You just, I, you really, you're just born with it. You know, some people have that, that passion um, and they just, they just have a, a fire in the belly and it goes on for every day of their life until they die, you know, at a hundred or whenever. Mm -hmm. um, that fire in the belly is ultimately what, in my opinion, is the, the secret sauce of, of success is you got to have a compulsion to closure. You have to have a compulsion mm -hmm. to get jobs done. You have to be ready, willing, and able to get up at three in the morning or not sleep at all. Like I did the other night coming here to California, I had to just pull an all nighter. So, you know, that was rough, but you just have to have that in you. Mm -hmm. And not everybody has that, you know, and that that's okay. It's not everyone's mission to do the type of work that you and I do. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's, everyone has their role, but if you really, really are like one of those people are like, I can make this, this reality of mine rock. You better have a fire in the belly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that resonates on all levels for me, big time. Wow. Okay. Well, this has been quite the transmission. I appreciate going a little over time to really, um, really stretch it out and get as much insight and perspective as we can. David Avocado Wolf, I appreciate you on all levels. Thank you for your friendship, being a colleague, being a mentor, helping me launch my career, whether you know it or not. Um, just all your support over the years and all the different ways that you show up has, um, has really helped fan the flames of my fire and you and many other people um, that, have, that have played those roles. So my eternal gratitude to you. Thank you so much for making the time to show up here and to do this for me and our audience. And if there's any last insights that you'd like to leave us, and obviously I want everybody to get a copy of The Beauty Diet um, and go to your website, www.davidwolf.com. Is there any concluding insights or anything that you'd like to share with everyone? Brett, thank you so much for, for your gracious and kind words and super proud of you and glad for what you're doing with your life and thank God for you and what you're doing. So keep up the great work. And um, in the meantime, the final words, I think this is going to be my last book for a while. I can, I can kind of see that. This could, I mean, this it's a lot, right? So final words is I think I'm going to transition more into doing more film and, and less books just because that's kind of where the medium is right now. You know, it's this, again, this is the, this is a, a, a repository of information. There's so much in here in the beauty diet. And by the way, everything you'd ever want to know about charcoal, charcoal skin masks, brushing your teeth with charcoal, it's all there. I, I think we got it all in there. Actually, when I finally got through the last like version of this book, I was like, we got it all in there. It's, it's all there. We're, we're done. We're good. We're done. So very excited to have it out. And um, what else? I'll see you at the longevity conference very soon. And I guess in parting words, the, the number one thing that I'd recommend is for everyone out there to have the best day ever. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And by the way, this is to keep your hair out of the chocolate. So I'm in a chocolate laboratory right now. So if you've been wondering what is this, what this getup is, the glasses I'm wearing are, they're basically, they polarize the light. 
so that you, a lot of the blue light and disorganized light doesn't actually get through to you. So I learned this from Dr. Mercola. He's like, you need to wear these kind of glasses inside because mm -hmm. the UV light has too much blue light and it's non-polarized. Whereas like sunlight is polarized light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. You just reminded me because I got two pairs of these true, true, uh, or the, the true dark glasses. I don't know if those are the ones you're wearing. I, this is... What is this? This is Swan Swanwick. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's awesome. And it, it was a gift. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. So when I'm in under fluorescent lights, I wear them. Um, but this is to keep hair out of the chocolate. So you know that's an important part of running a food operation. And yeah. I also like wearing this on shows because it just completely just it's the best. Yeah, the reactions from people that that's maybe the best thing like we didn't get to talk about this but Chocolate and sacred chocolate. Can we make a final note on that? Just because we have everyone watching and listening sacred chocolate by far without comparison and I can I think I'm pretty qualified at this point to make a recommendation in the chocolate industry. I've been a, a chocoholic and obsessed about chocolate. I've been to the sacred chocolate facility um, many a times with Steve Adler, he's really in, and I actually had a private label, uh, you know, the genius bar for a while. I partnered with, uh, with sacred chocolate and Steve Adler, and we got to concocting a pretty epic little chocolate bar while that lasted. Um, you know, so sacred chocolate, you know, can we just take a minute on that as we, as we channel out? I, I love that idea. Um, just the appreciations and blessings of this great enterprise that, you know, is just doing the impossible every single day and has been doing the impossible for 13 years straight. It really, you know, manufacturing any kind of food product in the state of California is nuts. Um, the regulations, the insanity of the whole thing, the cost, the tariffs, the taxes, the this, the that, it's just completely insane. But somehow Steve Adler stays on top of it and keeps this place, keeps the doors open and, and chocolate moving out the door. So sacredchocolate.com, sacredchocolate.biz. Those are the websites. Mm -hmm. Awesome. David, it's an absolute pleasure and honor. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ronnie. Rock on. Have